So I just want to share here with you, um, it, it's really difficult to find specific um, substance use data for the trans community. Um, and so um, I have to really um, reach out to my colleagues here in, um, in San Francisco to the Department of Public Health. And they have like generously just like, you know, sent me a whole bunch of like um, articles and data. And, you know, I tried to like just pull some, I think um, it's relevant to our didactic session today. Um, and because like the request that I had was um, really about mass and vitamin use and HIV, but I just want to like um, really set some expectation is like um, for substance use, you know, trans community, um, fifth, over 50% actually have reported like poly substance use. So it's not just one substance like specifically. And, and, um, and this is um, one of the studies that actually show what the breakdown looks like. But, but interestingly, you know, like, um, when we look at um, transgender um, youth, you know, age um, 16 to 24, um, they actually, a, a majority of them, like over 60%, actually report more marijuana use um, than um, methamphetamine use. You know, in fact, you know, in um, the, the data that I, I got, you know, which will be in the last slide, it shows that about 13% um, about um, um, of the youth um, uh, participated, um, reported using methamphetamine. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the really key slides to focus on is the second slide. And um, if you don't mind advancing to that. And to really highlight some of these key points, and then rather than just staring at all these slides, you know, I, 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 I thought this might be an opportunity, you know, to like share some personal stories, you know, about um, uh, methamphetamine use and um, and being transgender, especially for transgender people who um, engage in sex work and um, who are homeless. Um, so, as we can see, you know, I think that you know one of the key um, discovery that you know that we have is that um, transgender women um, reported methamphetamine use. Um, had a significantly greater odds, you know, in testing HIV positive compared to like um, non-user or episodic um, methamphetamine users. And when I tried to think about, you know, like what what I what episodic is, you know, and then I looked at, you know, this like weekly using. I almost thought, well, wouldn't weekly using be kind of episodic because it's not every day? But I guess it's it's not necessarily the case. So it's, it's really, you know, um, something that I think um, we really need to look a little bit deeper in, you know, it's like the frequency or the interval between uses, you know, in, in order to determine, you know, like what is like, um, you know, like um, significantly higher risk episodic use and, um, and like just general like recreational use. And, um, and I think that, that that would be, a, you know, like some, deeper conversations that, that need to happen. And um, we also like um, see that, you know, like if somebody, you know, at least using weekly, as I mentioned earlier, um, that, you know, they would already have a greater odds of testing HIV positive. I, I don't know much about physiology um, and also, you know, like pharmacy. So um, I wouldn't, I won't be able to like explain why that happens. Maybe you know like one of the docs you know like on um, on the team you know who can actually you know like um, you know like um, um, suggest you know like some possibilities there. Um, like I said, I don't want to like um, keep looking at these slides, so we'll just quickly go to the last slide and highlight the point that um, I made earlier that you know when we look at you know youth um, 16 to 24. Um, they are reporting, you know, like higher usage of marijuana than methamphetamine. And, um, and I think, you know, that's a good sign, right? You know, and in, in some instances, um, this might be a good um, harm reduction strategy, you know. And of course, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people use drugs, you know, and, um, and a lot of time, you know, and even for my own personal experience, it was associated with self-medicating, especially around depression and PTSD. Um, and, um, and for someone who has um, um, also attention deficit, you know, like um, it, to me, you know, methamphetamine was a drug, godsend um, 
dress um, because it actually took away a lot of those kind of like discomfort. Um, and I want to share a little bit of my story, even though it's a little old, um, like, uh, like my story um, was in the late 80s and uh, early 90s. I think that um, that's when um, cocaine and methamphetamine were in um, high circulations um, and there weren't as many designer drugs. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the reasons why this conversation is important today is it seems crystal meth is making a comeback and it is stronger than ever and it's more concentrated. And I think that one of the street names is ICE, um, is I'm correct. Um, and yeah, I'm old, so <laughs> these are new names for me. So, um, and I, I think that for um, for transgender community, it's it's pretty easy to understand why meth and salinine was could be a drug of choice for some of us. Um, it actually takes away a lot of the inhibition. It makes us feel invisible, and it also is a great um, appetite suppressant. So, you know, it. Uh, for some of us, you know, who have been like struggling with weight, um, methamphetamine seems to be like the miracle drugs, you know, that that could help us, you know, like lose the weight almost like overnight, of course, you know, and, and we thought we looked pretty, but, you know, but other people might not. Um, so, so for um, people who, use, who does sex, sex work, you know, like appearances and, you know, and also um, alertness, um, are really important because like for some of us who used to do sex work and who are still doing um, street-based sex work, um, it's really important to be really able to um, stay up when, you know, like when the market is high, um, so to speak. So um, this usually is between, you know, the twilight hours between um, eight in the evening to um, about four or five in the morning. So it really requires folks to try to stay awake, you know, like, and without the effect of, uh, like Tanya and I have this morning, you're drinking too much coffee and have like an elevated heart rate. So, um, so these are all the appealing reason why um, it seems people would use um, methamphetamine as a drug of choice. Um, but there are also a lot of side effects that nobody tells us about when we're using. Um, even though that it seems like it addressed some of our symptoms of like PTSD or depression or attention deficit, but um, prolonged usage actually makes those issues worse. And I think that those are the stories that we don't get to share a lot with like current users and, you know, trying to like not tell them to preach to them to stop, but to really like look at a way to tell them, you know, like this is what happened if you if you use like um, methamphetamine like I did, you know, like for over three years in a row, you know, and then these were the things that I experienced. I think that, you know, making those connections would be really helpful. I think that the other challenge that um, totally, I, it's understandable from the medical provider stand, standpoint is, it's not like some of the other substances that you can actually um, use a different way to detox people. It's not like alcohol, you can have like medications to address withdrawal. It's not like, um, you know, like opiates that you can actually prescribe medications or some goes on like maintenance methadone, you know, to take away, you know, some of the impact and effect. Um, there doesn't seem to be any real consensus on, you know, what is um, effective um, treatment for um, methamphetamine um, dependence. And there's some other things that, you know, that I don't hear people talk too much about um, uh, that's associated with other drugs. It's what we call the euphoric re recall, you know, and it seems I, I definitely, you know, as a personal um, uh, recovery um, substance abuse user, you know, that's something that I have experienced. And it's, you know, like that kind of temptation that is always there. You know, it doesn't matter how long you have not used it, but it's always there that you would remember that really um, succinct feeling of your first high, of our first high, and you know, and for some of us, we want to get back to the first high, and and you know, and so we go through these cycles. Um, and unfortunately, the more we use, you know, like the more that we um, start to neglect our health, you know, our body, and we stay up for days, and we start to get delirious, and we start to like hear voices, and I think that these are all side effects that we 
we need to find ways to make sure that people understand the impact of it. Um, I, and um, I don't really know how to like address these issues because it's not like I have um, a um, an answer to it, but we also know that over 40% of transgender people we surveyed, you know, in our positively trained studies would want to find, you know, a treatment program to address, you know, their substance use and their mental health. And unfortunately, you know, there are not a whole lot of programs that are specifically designed for transgender people and also um, um, the issue of like welcome trans include, include um, trans welcoming and, um, and inclusion, um, it's kind of like um, hit or miss, you know, and it depends on which cities you are in. And in some cities, you know, that have like really specific transgender program, maybe there will be like more empathetical providers that can work with um, patients. But in some rural areas, you know, like that might not exist. So, um, and I, I think that, you know, these are all the gaps and, um, and shortcomings, you know, of our current system that, you know, we really need to pay attention to. Um, I'm going to stop here because I think I might have used up my time of like 12 minutes. And um, uh, did Tanya just like shake her head? You have more time for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like maybe I can open that up for like, um, not too much, but for discussions or questions you might have for me. Um, I'll just really quickly say something. Um, I just read that because um, you had presented the statistic before uh, in the beginning that um, those who use might be more likely to end up being HIV positive or have a higher um, risk of ending up HIV positive, especially with anal intercourse, and that apparently there's a new biological pathway that they're proposing because it leads to inflammation in the rectal area, and that can kind of exacerbate your likelihood of getting HIV, which I think is very interesting and not something we're necessarily thinking about um because you know it, it's just like oh like i it makes you lose inhibition and all that and that's there too but then there might be something else happening inside the body that's making it more likely brian um <clears throat> yeah super quick thing and if if the talk is done kevin would you mind pulling the slides down just so we can see everybody and cecilia do you do you need the slides anymore <laughs> 